Good morning, beloved. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship together as the people of Grace United Methodist Church. My name is Jake. I am a forgiving child of God through no merit of my own, and I join you this morning as one member of our wonderful clergy team here at Grace, together with Pastor Glenn and Pastor Janelle, um, who uh, was rounding up the kids when I had to leave. We are a team in parenting and in ministry. I, uh, I want to just say a special moment, uh, take a moment to, to say a special welcome to you as I get tongue-tied. And, and thank you for uh, being with us this morning, whether you are a long-timer here or you're a visitor checking it out at Grace, whether you're joining us in person at our sanctuary, whether you are worshiping in your home, online, on YouTube or Facebook Live, it's just a joy across many places, many ways of being in this world that we are together in the love of Jesus Christ this morning. Grace is a community of love and belonging where all people are invited and encouraged to grow as followers of Jesus Christ. So I have a couple of invitations for you. First of all is we have a wonderful mission field in our building every day in Grace Education Ministries. We serve approximately 100 kids here on a daily basis if you weren't aware. And the staff is about, about two dozen people. The program has grown tremendously in the last 10 years. And I like to say it's a ministry of Grace Church if we make it a ministry of Grace Church. And so what I'm implementing is, you know, since there's very few things pastors can just control, you know, autocratically. And one of them is what's in the bulletin. So each month we'll be focusing our prayers of encouragement and support on one class for Grace Daycare and Readiness. And this month, for May, it'll be the AM and PM Readiness class. Their lead teacher, Mrs. Black, and their assistant teacher, Mrs. Baker, they do wonderful work here in our community, and um, what they do is hard, and I'll be the first to tell you I couldn't do it. So let's focus our prayers on them this month. No particular concern going on, just that I think they could use it, just the way we could use prayer too. I'd like to draw your attention to the red attendance pads. You can find the red pad nearest <coughs> to you where you're sitting. It would help us out tremendously if you take a moment to put your information in there, anything you'd like to share. Um, if you want to be added to our weekly email update, just put your email address in there and we'll put you right on it. Uh, I, think, I think Pastor Glenn has an announcement to share. Well, I'll fill that pad out for you later, Glenn. You're good. Yeah. Oh, I don't even have my mic. That's okay. We'll just use this. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Uh, the youth counselors and the youth came up with a plan uh, last week, uh, kind of a compilation of lots of things that we want to do. And we want to invite you to be a part of that if next Saturday is available to you. Uh, at 3 p.m., we're going to gather here at Grace United Methodist Church, and we're going to travel to a place called Black Rock. Black Rock is a niche's property. It's just uh, 25 minutes away. Uh, it's the only rock outcropping that overlooks the Wabash for about 100 miles in either direction. It's a hidden gem and uh, a neat place to, to hike and explore, and there's some, lots of small caves there, etc. cetera. Uh, and then we'll go on to Ross Hill Park uh, for a cookout and active games. So uh, families, people of all ages are welcome to come, be active in those games, or just spectate. Uh, we'll also take a hike at Ross, Ross Hill as well, an optional hike. Um, so that's, again, all the details. Uh, you should have received an email this week, and there'll be more in the email this week as well. So we invite you to join in on that. We do appreciate RSVP because um, then we know how much food to bring, and food's important. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pastor Glenn. We have a very fruitful ministry partnership with the Wesley Foundation, um, which has paid off in spades for us this year, I think. I'd like to invite our reader forward to uh, continue us in worship this morning. Come on up, Tom. Good morning. My name is Tom Basilia. I'm a member of the Grace family, and I'll be serving as your liturgist and reader this morning. So please rise. And let us join together with one heart and one accord as we share our call to worship. Uh, just to give you a preview, our response together this morning will be, Christ is risen. Alleluia. Can we just say that together one time? Christ is risen. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are here this morning to lay down our burdens, 
to walk in the light of God's love, and to find healing in the gospel truth. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We aren't all alike. We come from every age, every ability, and every background. We don't look the same, talk the same, or think the same. But by grace, we are one people. We are witnesses for Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We are followers of the way of Jesus, set free by his sacrifice, finding love and belonging at the foot of the cross. We are Grace United Methodist Church. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Please remain standing as we sing our first hymn, uh, Hymn of Promise, found on page 707. very rare that I have to pull a mic down. It's one of the things I like about serving here. Good morning. I'm Pastor Janelle, in case we have not met. Um, I'm here to share an invitation to giving, and I want to share this week about um, an, an hour or two that I got to spend with Becca Fielding on Wednesday. Um, I was so moved by her witness and her testimony and the way that she is serving um, Becca was telling me about how when she's home here in Lafayette, she spends so much of her time raising money so that she can go back to Kenya and do the work that God has called her to do. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, Becca Fielding serves as a missionary with um, Least of These, which is part of World Gospel Mission, and she's an occupational therapist who works with children with special needs um, and children who are in an infant orphanage in Kenya in Nairobi, um, and also the rural surrounding areas. Um, and Becca was just sharing with me, like, the way that missionaries are funded now is completely different than the way that it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, most missionaries were funded by churches. This church took this part, this church took this part. Becca has 30 to 40 individuals and families, and like a few churches, and of which we are one. We offer Becca the, um, the loose change or mission of the month, um, just like we do with Kim Clough and her husband, Joe. I was moved by that because it showed me that the people that are giving to Becca and helping her to do her work, they are funding someone to be the hands and foot of Jesus, hands and feet. Jesus did have two feet. <laughs> I, I have it on, on biblical authority. Um, so it, they're, they're, they're giving their money so that she can do something that they can't, right? Because not everybody's called to do that work. Not everybody's called to be an OT, and not everybody's called to go and do that work all the way on the other side of the world, and specifically among people who have significant special needs. She was sharing with me that um, a lot of the children that she serves probably would not have special needs if they lived here, because the, the medical care that they receive there is just not um, enough for them. So. I thought of that because I know that there are people in this congregation who give specifically to Becca's mission and also that we give to her um, as part of our mission of the month. But I also just thought about how that's, that's kind of what we do as a church too, right? Every, every week that we give, we are funding somebody, some person in our church, some ministry in our church to go and do things that we might not personally be called to do. I am not personally called to go and do every single thing that this church does. And I'm grateful that when I give to this church, I'm funding the ministries um, of others as well. So if you would like to um, give to our church and fund that ministry and be the hands and feet of Jesus where you're not called to personally go, there are three ways that you can give. Um, you can give in person. We have an offering plate on the outside of the sanctuary as you exit. 
You can give online over Realm, which you can access at lofgraceumc.org. And that's how Pastor Jake and I give, um, just automatically every week. Don't even have to think about it. Um, or you can give by mailing a check to our church office at the um, address listed on the screen. Thank you. here on the chancel if you'd like to. Always optional. You never have to. All right, everyone. Just keep right here. Is your mask attached to your face by a lanyard? That's really handy. I wish I had thought of that. Welcome, everybody. All right. So I've got a question for you. Who is your favorite Disney villain. Grant, right away, facts on the draw. Sid from Toy Story? Yeah, man, that, that dude does some pretty mean things. Yeah, anyone else? Favorite Disney villain? Avery? From, oh, Ursula, yeah, from The Little Mermaid. Man, she's mean. Yeah, doesn't do a single nice thing. <clears throat> she lies, too. All right, anybody else? Aya, what do you think? Ursula has a sister. Ursula has a sister? Is that like in Little Mermaid, too? Ah, okay. Yeah, With Melody? Okay, you're talking about a movie I've never seen. I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> All right, I'm, I just know the ones that I grew up with. Emmett? Is who? Dr. Doofenshmirtz. What movie is that from? From Phineas and Ferb, the TV show. Okay. Wow. I'm going to have to look that up sometime. So, another one? Okay, one last one. Dr. Ava from the Lego story. Okay. I think I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Man, that sounds awesome. So let's talk about all these villains. They're all mean. They're all cruel, usually. A lot of them tell lies to get what they want. Um, and a lot, what, what are some other things that villains do? Uh, hurts toys, so they're cruel, yeah. Usually they're greedy, they only think about themselves. Do you have an answer, Evelyn? What do you think, Evelyn? They're mean to each other, they're not even nice to other villains, isn't that weird? So if another, <coughs> another thing about villains is that they team up, yeah. Yeah, they put self-destruct buttons where nobody needs one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So one thing I noticed about villains is that they never, ever change. Every single movie, every single episode, they are the exact same villain. So they're always bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I see. So some villains are more complex characters. The ones I grew up with are all terrible all the time. <laughs> the, they never do anything good. And I'm glad the villains these days are a little more complex because that's more realistic. Okay. Yeah. 
I see. Pastor Jake's a mile deep in the weeds here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, grandkids uh, on the loose here. Okay, I want to bring it home to my point, which is that in the Bible, there's a, in the Bible, there's a whole lot of people. A lot of them do mean things. I, I'm really sorry. I, I need to continue with my lesson, but I'd love to hear more about this after church, okay? We are uh, a lot of bad people doing bad things. Not a single one of them is a villain because you know what? They can all change. And today in our story from scripture, we're going to learn about a guy named Saul who did a lot of mean and cruel things and then he changed. And the lesson of that story is that God can change anyone, no matter how mean they are. Because anyone who seems like a villain one moment could be a good guy the next moment, or a good gal. And that's an important lesson for the real world, is that always we have to remember people can change. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for letting us change and be different. No matter what we've done, no matter who we've been, we can be somebody new. Amen. Guys, this is my favorite part of the service. Thank you so much. Nothing like drawing them out with a topic that's just scintillating, right? I love it. So let's bring that to the Bible story that we're going to read this morning. This is a story uh, from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, and the text follows the new revised standard version of the Bible. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come now to, to a time of prayer, and I always commend to you the uh, prayer list that's on the back of your bulletin. I encourage you to take a look at it now and also uh, during the week as you pray. Uh, so we can be praying for um, uh, the people on that list that are near and dear to us uh, and those we don't know. I also want to lift up um, Audrey shared with me earlier that quite suddenly um, her son-in-law's brother, so Scott Miller's brother Troy, uh, passed away suddenly this week at the age of about 50. Uh, he was in Kentland and so we just pray for the, the whole family. Um, as they, they grieve uh, that sudden loss. I also want to lift up, um, uh, I deal with college students, and it's finals week at Purdue uh, this week, um, and also at other schools around town as well, St. Elizabeth's, um, Ivy Tech, other places. So just prayers for students. Uh, prayers for Wesley Foundation. Uh, we had our senior banquet yesterday. Uh, imagine losing a quarter of your congregation each year all of a sudden. <laughs> That's what happens at Wesley. Uh, some near and dear students uh, that we uh, started to say goodbye to yesterday. So let's turn to God in prayer. Uh, Lord, quite suddenly it's already the month of May. And uh, we thank you for the changing of the seasons. We thank you for uh, flowers emerging. We thank you for uh, warm weather maybe finally coming our way. Lord, help us to uh, take full advantage of the life that you've given us and each season of life and of the year. We ask for your prayers for the many concerns on the list, uh, many significant concerns, people we know, people we don't know. 
We also lift up the concerns of the world. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for those that are in harm's way, those that are being persecuted, those that are being oppressed. Uh, we also pray for the enemies, the villains of this world. Uh, we pray for a change of heart. We pray that they know that they are loved uh, so that they can change and love others. Lord, too often in life, we, we, we too play the part of the villain. We know that we are not completely innocent. We know that at times we make threats uh, and even commit acts of violence. So Lord, uh, forgive us. Forgive us when we fall short. Help us, Lord, to know that we too are loved by you and that we have a place in your family, the body of Christ. So as part of that transformation this week, Lord, uh, help us to be in prayer often to you and with you. And Lord, be with us now as we think through the words of this prayer that we say every week. Um, help them not just come out of our mouths, but also resonate in our souls. So hear us now as we pray together. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
um, pray our way into the sharing of the word this morning. I'd like to let you know if you're worshiping at home, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. The best way for you to participate in the ministry of the table here is by getting something from your kitchen that is like bread, I don't care what it is, and something that is like juice, even a little bit like juice, I don't care what that is either. And having those ready for the end of the service, that will make you part of the body of Christ as we break the bread and share the cup at the end of this service. Just a heads up for you. Let us be together in prayer. God, we are Grace United Methodist Church. We are an outpost of your beloved kingdom here in a world that can feel so unfriendly, impersonal, and unkind, and just plain chaotic. We are a cell community of forgiveness, love, and grace. So please, Lord, let everything we do this morning build us up in that grace, whether it's the hearing of the word, the hearing of and sharing of music, or simply being present with one another. Lord, build us up in grace. Amen. Guys, we need to talk about Mayor Humdinger. Scanning the room for knowing looks. Grandparents, parents of small children, Mayor Humdinger. If you're not familiar, he is the villain on a show which has established its presence in my household. Since Janelle and I became the parents of a two and a half and now three year old, it started around two and a half. He's a big fan of Paw Patrol. If you're not familiar with the concept, it doesn't take too long to explain. There are these dogs, right? And they're like, first responders, and they go to where there's emergencies, and they help people, and, and there's a dog who, ne there's a police dog who somehow never has to arrest anyone, and there's a fire dog who somehow never has to put out a single fire. So, like, it's hard, it, I guess it's harder to explain than I thought. But anyway, there's this guy, Mayor Humdinger. He's got a silly mustache and a silly hat. He's the mayor of the, of the rival town of Foggy Bottom, and he's always trying to cause chaos and and bring down the town of, I think it's called Adventure City. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Adventure Bay, thank you very kindly. <laughs> the rival mayor of the rival town is Mayor Humdinger, and he's always got some scheme to make a big mess or, or take over or, or make a bunch of money or take something that's not his and never quite get what's coming to him. Anyway, the thing about Mayor Humdinger is he's the same from episode to episode, right? He does not learn his lesson. He's always self-centered, cowardly, entitled, greedy, and unkind to others. He says, I'm sorry, and does the right thing only when he gets caught, and he's under extreme social pressure to do so. He's got a whiny voice that can grate on a parent's nerves from three rooms away. <laughs> Mayor Humdinger. He's the first example of a villain in my son's entertainment life, but I've got a feeling... He won't be the last, the first of many. Just to name the examples from my childhood, sooner or later there will be Uncle Scar from Lion King, Ursula from The Little Mermaid, Jafar from Aladdin, that jerk Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Or if he gets into Superman, it'll be Lex Luthor. If he's a Star Wars guy, it'll be Emperor Palpatine. Characters who are always awful. <laughs> the only good thing these characters do is like fall off a cliff. Or, or get thrown in jail until the next episode, when, when they're right back at it. <laughs> These stories are tidy and, and perhaps helpful in some ways for kids who need to live in a very orderly, moral universe. But for grown-ups who are coping with the real world as it is hurled at us in news stories every day, we need to be suspicious of any story that has a perennial bad guy or bad gal. There is evil in this world. It's radical and it's absolute. But I'm going to say something difficult and controversial in saying that there are not evil people in this world. There are people who are caught up in evil all their lives. There are people who are doing evil things, people trapped in evil systems, people leaving evil legacies for the rest of us to clean up, people who spend their entire lives making other people miserable. But there is not one evil person. You will not convince me. Otherwise, it is an ideological gospel belief that I hold. 
There's just human beings made by God, loved by God, called by God, always free to do evil whenever we so choose, but always loved by God. Whether we're making hurtful choices or helpful choices, whether we're acting like villains or acting like heroes, we are just human beings loved by God. In the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it's the story from Scripture we kind of spend some time in after Easter because it reminds us of the early days of our movement when the Spirit was moving things along at a breathtaking clip. It's a good story for us to be in touch with as we seek revival in the midst of our congregation today. In, that, in Acts chapter 7, there is a moment where it looks like we're about to meet the supervillain of the Jesus story. All right, so real quick. Acts chapter 6 and 7, there's this guy, Stephen. Scripture says he's got a face that looks like an angel, so he looks a lot like me. I'm just kidding. He's full of faith in the Holy Spirit, like Pastor Glenn, full of grace and power, like Pastor Janelle. He's very good at explaining how Jesus completes the promises God made in the Old Testament. Some people who can't seem to beat him in arguments, they get mad. They get jealous, and they have him arrested. And he doubles down on his Jesus ideas. He's still very good at explaining. He's not afraid of making people angry. So it says they dragged Stephen out of the city and began to stone him. And those who were there as witnesses, they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And it says Saul approved of their killing of Stephen. So he wasn't the one throwing the rocks, but he was there and he liked what was happening, so we'll call him a murderer. He is set up to become the arch villain, the arch nemesis of the book of Acts. We know that he goes on later to, go, to seek out, any time he's in a synagogue, to seek out people who are talking a little too much about this Jesus guy, to trap them with their own words and to get them arrested and thrown out and sometimes killed just like Stephen. Sounds like a baddie to me. Of course, the story takes a very strange turn in Acts chapter 9, which Tom read for us this morning. The only villain in the book of Acts, the only villain in the Jesus story, is the one who becomes the gospel's greatest champion of all time. Saul, the evil jerk villain guy, becomes Paul the messenger of Jesus to all the nations. So the book of Acts, 20-some chapters long, it's about the length that a scroll could be before it got to be too heavy to carry around, about 18,000 words. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, he considers one story so important that in the limited space he has in this one scroll, he needs to tell this story three times. Once in chapter 9, as it happened, Tom read for us. Again, in chapter 22, after Paul is nearly killed by an angry mob in Jerusalem, hauled in front of the Roman tribune, he tells the story again. And then a third time, he's dragged before King Herod Agrippa <clears throat> in the local Roman headquarters of Caesarea. He tells the story again, even longer. The story of how the villain becomes the hero. The conversion of Saul, whose other name was Paul. The most interesting part of the story was that it was 100% God's work to change Saul's heart from the guy who murdered Christians to the guy who risked being murdered for the name of Jesus. No one confronts him, no one beats him up or throws him in jail or throws him off a cliff or threatens his life. No one treats him like a villain. He doesn't get the villain's ending. He is just fresh off of helping to murder Stephen. He's getting some of his friends arrested and killed. Now he's going on his way to the city of Damascus, looking to do some more hurting, to round up anyone following the way of Jesus, men or even women, it says. Going on his way. His way of hate, jealousy, we'll call it pettiness, small-mindedness, 
self-righteousness, going on his way, going along against the way of Jesus. Remember the first name that our movement had before we were called Christians, long before we were called United Methodists, we were called, according to Acts, followers of the way of Jesus, the way of forgiveness, love, and healing, ideally. Isaiah says in chapter 55, according to God, God says, my ways are not your ways. So there's God's way, and, and there's kind of the way Paul was following. And I wonder, who else do we imagine today walking in that same way that Paul walked, the way of hatred, violence, jealousy, pettiness, greed, there's a guy in the news whose name starts with P and rhymes with Schmooten. Every time I read the news about what's happening in Ukraine, I think, how can there be a person who has the power to stop this and does not? What can possibly be the contents of such a person's heart? How can so much hate and self-centeredness be packed into such a small space? And history is littered with other people just like that, kind of fitting that same mold, walking in the way that Paul was walking, Saul was walking that day, fresh off of doing some harm, looking for more harm to do. That's just the big one in the news. We can probably think of the people who've played the villain in our own lives. Some of us are living deeply wounded, we've been deeply harmed. There are characters who for the sake of our healing journeys, have had to be cast in the villain's role, which is why it's so incredibly hard for us to recognize all people as beloved children of God because some people just plain do harm. Some people bounce from wrong to wrong, convinced in their own mind that either God is okay with what they're doing or else there is no God. Paul's story proves that it all can change. No villain has to stay a villain. Paul has this encounter with Jesus. The bright light knocks him down. He says, who are you, Lord? The voice comes back, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Let's sit with that for a moment. We don't often think about, we don't often recognize how much it can hurt to realize that God loves the world, right? If you've been living as though God doesn't care what you do, or if you've been living as though there is no God, to suddenly realize that there is one, and he's full of love for the whole world, then that becomes the lens through which you view every harmful thing you have ever done. And the more harm we have done, the more it hurts to recognize how much God loves us and loves the people we have hurt. And I have to imagine that there was deep agony in Paul's heart when he realized, oh my God, what have I done? Who have I been? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I have put my best energy into hurting the people who are following the way of the Son of God. And then comes the life-changing reality that God doesn't just love, God also forgives. And Paul got to live the rest of his life in God's forgiveness. Now Paul tells the story two more times. The story is told a little more completely each time we hear it, maybe to save space. By the third time, we get a lot more of what Jesus told Paul. This is as Paul told King Herod Agrippa in chapter 26. Jesus says, get up, stand on your feet, as though to say, I'm not here to make you feel awful. I'm here to change the world. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you, Saul, persecutor, to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the nations of the world 
to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, and here's the point, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of the evil one to the power of God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The gospel in a small nutshell. Saul is raised up to share the message of love and forgiveness with the rest of the world, the same message he was trying to squish out. He would eventually take that message before kings, before the Roman emperor. And the important thing to remember is there's only one Saul in this story. Saul, the persecutor of the church, wasn't special. He wasn't evil. He was just broken. And in his brokenness, he was hurting other people. And then Saul, the champion of the gospel, taking it to the ends of the earth, he wasn't special either. He wasn't super. He was just saved and loved and sent, committed to living the rest of his life in that belovedness that he had. That Saul, the persecutor, was always Saul, the future messenger of God's love. And Saul, the messenger of God's love, was always the former persecutor of the church. One character, one story. Villain or hero? Yes, both. The 19th century Irish poet Oscar Wilde said, The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. We are always becoming a new thing, never finished. We're always finding the way of Jesus together amidst all the other hurtful and destructive ways we could choose, maybe have chosen in the past. The Lord's Supper is a moving experience because no matter what we've done, no matter who we've been, no matter how we have been hurt, no matter how wrecked we feel, we have a place just for us at the table where Jesus welcomed his best friends and Judas, the one who would betray him with the same love and welcome. And Jesus made a place at his table for Saul, the one who persecuted him and tried to destroy those following his way. When we say Christ our Lord invites to his table those who love him, who earnestly repent, which is to say earnestly desire to change from their sin, who seek to live in peace, think of all those who fit that description now, who at one time in their lives didn't. Think of a time in your life when you did not fit that description. Those who love Jesus earnestly desire to change. And think about all those who do not fit that description now. Not even remotely. But could. But could. If the miracle of conversion is real. If God really can do in this world what God did for Paul. If people can change because God can reach into our lives and change us, then it's worthwhile to pray that people will be changed. It's worth imagining people being different than they are now. It's worth imagining the worst, most destructive sinners in the world, the worst, most destructive people in our lives. And It's worth imagining them feeling the weight of what they have done and who they have been and living a different life in God's forgiveness and love. A life of repentance. A life trying to balance out the harm they have done with the healing that Jesus does. Every sinner, every villain has a future. It's hard for me to say this because I know some will not choose that future. Some people will not ever say yes to God, but they all can. God's vision is that they all can. All are wanted at Christ's table for the low, low price of loving God and desiring forgiveness. And that's the good news that changed my life. I hope it has changed yours and it can change anyone's. Let us pray. Lord, you died and suffered and rose again for our sake, not the people who live upright lives, faithful lives, 
also the ones who live harmful, hurtful, destructive lives. You died for love of all of us. You call all of us. And we pray for that day when everyone you are calling, everyone listens and answers and faces the reality of your love, the depths of who they have been, and the possibility of a new life. We pray for that day when those who hate your way the most will come to your table weeping, filled with joy, ready to live new lives. In Jesus' name, we are bold to pray. Amen.
you be my assistant, Glenn? Thank you so much for that gift of music, sign language interpretation. It's wonderful. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. This morning we will be singing the congregational responses during our great Thanksgiving. We'll be using musical setting A, which is found on pages 17 and 18 of the United Methodist Hymnal. The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from our captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he was to give himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, a holy and living sacrifice, together with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery that is our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all this world, until Christ shall come in final victory, and we will feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father and Mother, who Lord art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and, and the, the power, and, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're joining us at home and you have your thing that is like bread, would you tear it into two pieces? And as we say, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in the one loaf. At Grace United Methodist Church, the bread we use here is gluten-free. If you're worshiping at home, would you lift up the cup with me? The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ, poured out for love of the world. Right now we are still serving the Lord's Supper as we exit the building in the entryway. So as we, as we leave the sanctuary, you may follow out the main worship entrance, and we will serve you at that place. Um, I mentioned the, ble the bread was gluten-free. We also use grape juice instead of wine, as some of our brothers and sisters do. Let us pray. Eternal God, God we, give we give you thanks, thanks for this, for this holy, holy mystery in which, which you, you have given, given yourself to us. us. Grant, Grant that, that we, we may go into, into the world in the, in the strength of your, your spirit, spirit to give, give ourselves for others. others. In the, the name, name of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Please stand and join us for our last hymn of the day. And it's just the first verse of I'll Fly Away. It's in the faith we sing, 2282. From this place to wherever the Spirit will take you this week, in love and service to the God who changes villains into heroes, the God who's always making of us a new creation, go forth carrying the gospel of love with you. Amen. Amen.